Hello everyone and welcome to video 5 of the Thermal Hydrogen Invention Drive. My name is Jared Moore and today's video is unique because um, the focus of today's video is not so much on inventions, but it's about uh, providing an international vision for thermal hydrogen. So instead of starting out with the technical content and then going towards um, some inventions, um, we're going to start out with inventions today. And uh, the reason I'm going to do that is because um, these inventions or, or how these existing technologies fit in thermal hydrogen, maybe I should say that, but um, give me the benefit of the doubt here and call them inventions. So the inventions today um, are about coal, basically. Okay, so with, um, you know, having inventions for coal and then also, you know, being able to use natural gas and oil, you know, in, in, in you know, simpler ways that I've already described, uh, you know, we've pretty much got all the fossil technologies or fossil suppliers covered. And so then I'll be able to provide an international vision. And right? so, you know, having described how we can use all energy suppliers, I can tell you uh, why I've located these pipelines, syngas, oxygen, and CO2, where I have in the international vision. Okay, so today I'm going to be answering two main questions, I think. All right, so the first question is, uh, are we going to run out of fossil fuels? Is it worth it to build this international pipeline system? And the second question is, well, you know, given that the implementation will be uneven, um, how will fossil fuel prices be affected globally? And then will that thwart your plan for, you know, an emissions-free planet? Okay, so, uh, to answer the first question, all right, that's why I'm going over coal today, okay, because coal is our most abundant resource, and uh, many countries around the world don't have oil and gas, and so if, if coal is not included in the vision, then these countries aren't included in the vision, so I don't want that, so everyone's included, and uh, today I'll be talking about how we're going to use coal in a different way than has been previously envisioned, and uh, how we're going to use it with biomass. All right, so by going through that, and then by talking about how much oil and gas we have in place, and then how we can use CO2 enhanced oil recovery and, and, and enhanced gas recovery, uh, I'm going to make an argument that we have centuries of fossil fuel supplies, and um, you know, in, you know, and, and after that, you know, I don't know how economic methane hydrates will be. You know, I know someone working on um, some promising technologies, but there's more methane hydrates. Uh, then they're all then there are all the fossil fuels combined okay so i would argue that we have centuries of fossil fuels in oil gas and coal and then we have centuries of methane hydrates uh, but i don't think that you know we're necessarily going to use every you know last btu of, of fossil fuels on the planet i think that we will transition to algae and so that's the other technology i'll be talking about all right so algae is the dense biofuel and not only does every continent have a plan to use its local fossil resources, every continent has a plan to transition to algae over time. Okay, so every continent on Earth has a strong fossil fuel resource, a strong, a strong wind resource, and a strong solar resource. Okay, the solar resource is going to what is what's going to allow the algae. All right, so every continent is included. Um, and um, we have a long-term plan. We're not going to run out of fossil fuels. Okay, now... Is this plan going to affect fossil fuel prices in such a way that you know we might have a situation where we're increasing carbon emissions, right? Because what's the point if some countries decrease if, if other countries increase? All right, so here's the concern. Given that we're going to use less oil, um, and then given that we're going to add to oil supply with enhanced oil recovery, how low are oil prices going to get? And then um, if oil prices get so low, will then other countries be encouraged to use oil in internal combustion engines? So um, yes, that's a possibility. They could be encouraged, but then again, um, even if oil is the cheapest resource for uh, a country, then it still makes sense for them to use oil um, by turning it into methanol and then using that methanol in a solid oxide fuel cell. All right. so. I'm going to go over the rationality for that today too, 
so that people realize, you know, even if we do enhanced oil recovery, you know, the, um, the price of oil is not going to tank, first of all, by just looking at, um, you know, the physics of the situation. And then secondly, um, physics tells us that if we use oil in a heat engine, it's going to be less efficient than using that oil um, in a solid oxide fuel cell, you know, converting it to methanol and then using it in a solid oxide fuel cell. So um, that's what I'll be talking about today in international vision for, um, you know, how to transition fossil fuels from carbon emitting to emissions free, and then how to transition from fossil fuels to algae. All right. So a uh, big day today, uh, lots of people worried about um, carbon emissions and fossil fuel supply. So, you know, hopefully after today, you won't worry about it anymore. You know, one less thing. Okay. So hope you'll join me today. Thank you. Okay, so first thing, let's talk about how much fossil fuel supply we have, and then I'm going to tell you, you know, in rank order, how we're going to use those supplies. All right, so if you recall from video zero, um, I reasoned that um, we're not running out of fossil fuels any supply anytime soon. In fact, we continue to add to it. Okay, so I showed you this graph and I said, you know, there are proved reserves, and then there's you know, the majority of it, which isn't uh, what's called approved reserve. So approved reserve basically means we know exactly where it is. We know it's economic. We just haven't extracted it yet. All right. So um, over time, you know, we've kept up our ratio of approved reserves to demand because we've continued to find new resources and then we've continued to advance technology to make previously uneconomic resources more economic. Okay, so that's why we've had such consistency um, with um, keeping uh, supply and demand balance. That's why, you know, over the long term, there's hardly any uh, price growth in fossil fuel supplies, uh, which would be, um, you know, very unexpected given that we're, quote, running out. Well, you know, we're not, um, we're not running out. Okay, we just continue to find more and more. Okay, and so the time in which we, you know, run out, I don't think is going to be for centuries. All right, so the reason I say that is, um, you know, let's put some numbers on that graph earlier. Okay, so you're seeing here that, you know, we've barely consumed, you know, the fossil fuel supplies remaining in the ground. And um, there's plenty and plenty and plenty of coal out there. And uh, so that's what I'll be talking about today. And then we also have a lot of uh, unconventional oil and gas. All right, so um, today I'll also be talking about how we're going to use that because what we're going to do is we're going to take the CO2 that we create from other fossil fuel processes and then push out more oil and gas with enhanced oil and gas recovery, which will allow us to take on you know, that unconventional uh, gas and oil you're seeing there. All right, so just by virtue of looking at all of the supply on this chart here, um, you, know, you would be led to believe that we are not fossil fuel supply constrained at all. Okay, so um, now what I'd like to do um, is show you um, how we're going to use coal differently and then um, you know, tell you why, why I think coal will have this future role uh, in our economy. Okay, now let's talk about um, coal's role in the thermal hydrogen economy. All right, so what differentiates coal from the other hydrocarbons? Well, it's that it's a solid, all right? It's a solid hydrocarbon, all right? So I think we'd probably all be better off if we didn't have names for the different hydrocarbons. We just saw it, we just called it, uh, we just called coal solid hydrocarbon, gas, gas hydrocarbon, and then oil liquid hydrocarbon. You know, I think that would be better, of course, still not very specific, but anyway, that's what they are. And um, the significance of them having different phases is basically that oil and gas can be used in a gas turbine and uh, coal cannot, all right? You have to gasify it first. So um, gasification is basically partial oxidation, okay? So, um, Oil and gas have a huge advantage on coal because um, if you can go through a gas turbine, that means you can have a much more efficient power plant. All right? It's called a combined cycle. So a combined cycle is basically um, 
you know, what you see when you fly in a plane, a big uh, gas turbine, uh, of course that one runs on oil, and um, basically on the back end of this turbine, you know, all of these very hot um, flue gases coming out, and what a combined cycle is, is when you take advantage of those hot temperatures uh, to fuel a steam, a steam cycle, a steam turbine, okay? So it's called the combined cycle because it's got a gas turbine and a steam turbine. Well, right now, by and large, except for just a few exceptions, all coal just has steam turbines. You know, we don't, we don't gasify it normally, okay? So coal's efficiency is much lower. Like we're talking in the 30 to 40% range, all right? Whereas a combined cycle plant can be in the 50 to 60% range, all right? So the combined cycle just shows you a, the precedent, um, but of course what I'd like to do is go towards the alum cycle, which is a supercritical CO2 turbine. Uh, but the rules remain the same. In order to use coal in that cycle, you've got to gasify it first. All right. So my my vision, or you know, at least this is my opinion, is that we should just forget about coal in the power industry. Period. All right. Um, with the exception of existing power plants that we are going to retrofit. Okay. I don't think coal thermodynamically should be in the power sector uh, because it doesn't go through a gas turbine and we're going to have to gasify it to, to get it to that phase, all right? So gasifying coal is not the same thing as, as natural gas, all right? So natural gas is a hydrocarbon, all right? Gasified coal is syngas, whoops, syngas. So this is fuel cell ready. This needs to be reformed, all right? So the, if you send syngas into a power turbine you're violating one of my, you know, one of my thermodynamic rules, right? Don't send over-organized heat source when the less organized heat source would do. So what I think we should do with coal is gasify it, make it into syngas, and that's it, okay? Because we've got an economy ready for syngas, okay? And then we've got an economy which provides the pure oxygen, all right? So... Coal is severely disadvantaged in the power sector due to thermodynamics, but it gets worse than that when you start talking about operations. Because if grid, if, if grid prices are going to be volatile because of renewables, where does the coal gasifier go when gas prices, you know, or when electricity prices are low? That basically means we're going to have to idle uh, gas, a coal gasifier, which is capital intensive. All right, so it doesn't make sense from a thermodynamic perspective, doesn't make sense from an economic perspective. Okay, so I think over time, coal will leave the power sector and then oil and gas to the extent that fossil fuels are used in the power sector. I think it'll be largely dominated by renewables and nuclear, but to the extent that fossil fuels goes to the power sector, I think it'll be oil and gas and not coal. All right, so let me show you, you know, just the basic schematic of how, you know, I foresee coal being utilized. Okay, let's take a closer look at coal and uh, that'll tell us how we uh, can harness it. All right, so this is a coal molecule. Uh, it's much more complicated than methane. Uh, the, the key characteristic to take away is that at the end of the day, when you count up all the hydrogen and carbon uh, atoms there, coal has about a one-to-one -one hydrogen to carbon ratio, whereas you know the other fuels have more favorable hydrogen to carbon ratios. And that's why coal, uh, when fully combusted, uh, releases more CO2 uh, per unit of heat. So uh, we're not going to fully combust it and uh, we're going to overcome that high carbon to hydrogen ratio uh, through gasification. So the thing about gasification is that those carbon molecules can be turned into energy carriers with nothing more than uh, CO2 and water. Okay, so uh, that's those are that's a valued commodity right there because it's fuel cell ready. All right, the syngas, and uh, you know the downside of uh, gasifying is that you know we have to build this gasifier, which is obviously capital intensive, and then we have to cool down um, the exhaust so that we can remove the particulates and the pollutants. All right, so that's the cost, and uh, you know the gain is that coal is quite cheap and plentiful. So, um, you know, how we're going to use uh, 
coal and thermal hydrogen is pretty basic. We're just going to gasify it. Okay, so I uh, spent the previous four videos talking about the oxygen sources, and um, you know that's going to combine with water to gasify coal, and then that presents our um, you know highly valued commodity here, uh, fuel cell ready chemicals. And then since we have the CO2 pipeline right here, well, that's no problem. We just sequester the CO2. So um, the high carbon content of coal can actually be an advantage for the climate. So um, we would like to gasify biomass, but biomass gasification uh, is somewhat technically difficult because um, it has such a high moisture content. So the high carbon content of coal uh, can uniquely balance that. All right, so coal is kind of a unique enabler of negative emissions because the CO2 for the biomass is going to come from the atmosphere. All right, so who'd have thunk that, you know, coal would be a ticket to negative emissions, but uh, that's, the, that's the versatility of carbon, guys. So um, in the long term, um, I would hope that we would transition to this technology called underground coal gasification. Uh, underground coal of the gasification is basically moving the gasifier um, far underneath the, the surface and that way you don't have to build a gasifier and you also don't have to mine coal. All right, so uh, thermal hydrogen is uniquely positioned for this because we're providing the pure oxygen. And then, um, you know, we're just going to use uh, what it produces um, straight, you know, the syngas. Okay, so uh, you know, everybody envisions this being used for electricity, you know, I disagree. Okay, so, um, you know, it's just pretty basic here how it would fit into thermal hydrogen. So we're giving the oxygen again, and, you know, just the only difference here is that we're going down instead of, um, you know, doing it above the surface. So uh, this is, um, you know, what is available in the long term for coal because much of coal is not mineable uh, because it's too far down. So uh, when that's the case, well, we can do underground coal gasification. Okay, now what I'd like to do is introduce you to the international vision and then tell you why coal uh, is an integral part of it. Okay, so let's start out by looking at that graph I showed you earlier, which shows the prices. All right, so if you just only thought about thermodynamics, then you would think that gas would be the most valuable, then oil, and then coal, because gas has you know, the least amount of particulates, uh, gas is the most simple, and um, you know, it has the best energy content. Okay, but that's just thermodynamics, all right? But that doesn't tell us, thermodynamics doesn't tell us the value of a substance based on location. Okay, location, it really isn't in thermodynamics. So, the reason why oil is higher priced than gas uh, is because um, it's pumpable, which means the oil can find you know, a buyer internationally. So that means there's increased demand for it because the transaction costs are lower. So uh, natural gas's advantage to uh, over coal uh, both thermodynamically and from a location perspective because um, natural gas can go anywhere on the continent, right? Because it can go through a pipeline. So natural gas, you know, has some flexibility in location, uh, but not as much as oil, but still much more than coal. All right, and now coal, you know, its, it's price remains quite stable because, you know, the buyer has to come to it. It doesn't go to any buyer, all right? So... That buyer usually comes in the form of some, you know, very large corporation, which also brings a copper transmission line. Okay, so, you know, that's why coal almost exclusively goes towards the electricity sector, all right? And that's why petroleum almost exclusively goes towards the transportation sector. So, um, you know, this, you know, the solid liquid gas thing, you know, it's kind of a big deal, all right? So... The way that um, this comes into play in the thermal hydrogen vision is that, um, you know, we're processing everything, you know, through some sort of pure oxygen at some point in some time, either through full oxidation or through partial oxidation. So um, gas prices being lower than oil means that people would prefer gas you know, not just because they don't have to deal with the particulates and like any cleaning, but um, because it's cheaper. 
So I anticipate every country that has gas, you know, using as much of it as they can. But most countries in the world don't have gas, all right? So they're going to be making a choice between oil and coal. So, you know, this vision really wouldn't be that great if everybody has to, to go to oil because, you know, that basically means that the price is going to remain, you know, higher for a long time, all right? So, um, what will happen is um, those countries that don't have gas, uh, they'll just make a decision basically. Um, is the cost of gasified coal less than the cost of, of, of oil, all right, or gasified oil? So I anticipate the countries that um, have lower exchange rates, and we're talking about mainly India and China, um, I anticipate those countries um, you know, preferring gasified coal because, you know, with lower exchange rates, you know, lower, lower labor costs, basically, that means that their gasifier is going to cost less as far as the capital cost of it. And then it means that, you know, they're going to have cheap labor costs for extracting the coal, All right? So the way this plays out internationally and how it will benefit everyone internationally is that those countries that don't have gas, but have lower exchange rates will use their coal. And that means that the demand for oil will go down even more. Okay, so that means the price of oil will go down even more, which means that those countries which have neither gas or coal will still be able to afford an energy supply of fossils uh, because, you know, by virtue of everyone else using their local resources. All right, so, you know, Japan doesn't have many fossil resources, period, and Southeast Asia here, it's going to be difficult to connect them to a pipeline. So those countries that really can't access gas or coal will be benefited by the other countries using coal. Okay, and this will also add to global stability, all right, because, you know, we're a planet that's been plagued with geopolitical problems around oil, right, for, you know, almost a century now. So um, this should end because, you know, let's just, let's just think of a hypothetical situation here, guys, where... Let's say, you know, Europe and Russia are having tensions and, you know, one reason or another, either Europe boycotts Russia or Russia cuts off Europe, okay? So let's say Europe still doesn't want to use its coal resources. That means the price of oil will go up. And that means these other countries will say, I don't want to use oil. You know, it's, it's price is going up. Why don't we fire up another coal gasifier? And then that will cause a benefit in Europe because then the oil prices will go down. Okay, so no matter what happens, you know, given that oil's trade on an international market and that coal is available inter almost internationally, then the prices should come down and they should be stable. Okay, so that's why, that's why coal is integral, okay, because you know, if we reduce the number of options in some of these countries, then it's going to be too expensive for them. Okay. So, um, that's why, you know, it's so important to be inclusive and to think about, you know, how an action here in Europe might affect, um, you know, Southeast Asia and then how, you know, East Asia and Southwest Asia might, you know, work to solve that problem. Okay. So, now what I'd like to do is go to PowerPoint and, and walk you through every continent and why each continent is designed or its pipeline system is designed in the way that it is. Okay, let's start out in the United States and um, also review uh, why these pipelines exist and then I'll show you the resources that are going to fuel them. So in video one, I introduced you to these pipelines and the bi-directional power plants that they would house. And, uh, you know, that's basically inventions number one to six. So these uh, power plants supply the grid when renewable energy supply is short. And then they help with uh, heat assisted electrolysis when re renewable energy supply is long. Okay, so it's the renewable electricity that powers the um, electrical part of electrolysis and then the nuclear reactors, which help with the heat. So we're also, uh, in addition to doing heat assisted electrolysis, we're going to electrolyze CO2. So that way we uh, can move a hydrogen carrier rather than uh, pure hydrogen itself. 
So in video two, I showed you how the byproducts of electrolysis, both syngas and oxygen, would uh, meet at a reformer block with a hydrocarbon in water to produce easy to distribute hydrogen carriers. Uh, these hydrogen carriers would be uh, distributed through uh, the existing uh, pipeline system. Okay, so we're going to convert existing uh, oil pipelines to methanol and then natural gas pipelines to ammonia and then possibly also converting some pipelines to CO2 so we can send the CO2 from users back to uh, the thermal hydrogen transmission system. So in video four, I showed you um, how we would use these pipelines for industrial heat. And, uh, you know, and then today I showed you how these uh, pipelines would then uh, gasify coal. So um, each country's uh, pipeline system is designed around its resources. So in the United States, uh, we want to put these pipelines next to where there's going to be an oversupply in electricity, and that's going to be where we have the strongest renewable resources. Then we want to send the, the, the byproducts from electrolysis towards the immovable and strong um, um, hydrocarbon products, biomass and coal. Okay, and then we'll just depend upon the gas to come to the energy system. But in this case, you know, we're, we're kind of, um, you know, going towards the gas anyway. All right. And then we also want to have some access to enhanced solar recovery, which we will um, uh, through uh, West Texas. So uh, each continent is basically um, a way to send uh, the oxygen or byproducts of electrolysis from renewable energy resource towards solid hydrocarbons. So here's the vision for Europe. Uh, Europe's got strong wind resources in the north. It's got strong solar resources in the southwest. And then it's got strong coal in Germany, Poland, and the Ukraine. So, um, you know, um, I anticipate uh, the, the European continent still using Russian gas, but, you know, some players wanting to use uh, their local coal, which is great. And then um, another thing I should mention about Europe is that, you know, they have a lot of diesels. So um, a transition fuel for Europe is called uh, DME, um, dimethyl ether. So uh, DME is basically dehydrated methanol, which we're going to produce. And uh, DME can be used in a diesel engine. OK, so it's still going to emit CO2 into the atmosphere, but it's going to be much, much cleaner. OK, so DME is going to be a great transition fuel. Uh, which I hope will be used widely in Europe. Um, in China or uh, India here, uh, wind and solar resources are strong in the, on the western part of the country. Uh, coal is in the, the eastern part of the country. And um, you know, the reason it's got this little bend here is to uh, make room for Mumbai there. Okay, so uh, moving on to China. Um, China's got great wind and solar resources to the north and southwest and then uh, you know it's got some real strong coal in the east and northwest and then uh, here's a pipeline which extends to Kazakhstan and then uh, Russian coal okay so this is a pipeline that already exists so that's why I chose it instead of this direct pipeline okay so uh, you know that's China um, and then here's Australia so Australia is um, you know, it's, it's got an internationally known coal resource and solar resources. Um, fewer people probably know about the wind resource uh, down there in the roaring 40s. OK, so it's got it's got all three. OK, let's take a look at South America. So South America is a unique continent because it doesn't really have strong coal resources, uh, but it does have a lot to offer. See, it has um, oil and gas in uh, Venezuela. And then it has, um, you know, possibly the world's third largest uh, gas resource in Argentina. So that's a shale gas resource. It's unknown how economic it is. Um, South America has got an international reputation for uh, producing biofuels in Brazil. And then it also has, you know, the uh, Atacama Desert in northern Chile. So that's got very, very strong solar resource. And then uh, the wind resource down here in the Roaring Forties uh, is also quite strong. So uh, even though it doesn't have coal, coal has uh, quite a bit to offer. Okay, moving on to the Middle East. Um, the Middle East oil resources are well known. Uh, they also have a lot of gas, so I anticipate this, uh, you know, mostly going to India. And uh, Africa's plan is uh, pretty unique because um, the uh, 
transmission grids, um, you know, I don't think are large enough to warrant, you know, a large pipeline system yet. So uh, it's Africa is going to uh, start from within with a with a solar powered microgrid. OK, so I'll be introducing that in the next video. Uh, this microgrid um, also comes with some other off grid inventions as well as a method to produce water. So um, over time, Africa will be connected to the other continents uh, through these pipelines. OK, let's zoom out and kind of uh, look at this from an international perspective now. Uh, these pipelines are basically um, going from wind and solar resources towards coal resources. And um, the assumption here is that uh, gas resources um, can be piped towards this pipeline uh, somehow. And if that isn't possible, then oil certainly can. OK, so these are basically renewable to coal. Uh, pipelines. All right, so let's see how we did in uh, covering uh, the world's uh, best coal resources. Okay, so uh, the United States, obviously, uh, we've got pipelines going towards it. So here's Russia's pipeline. Uh, here's China's pipeline system. Here's Australia's. Uh, here's India's. Uh, Germany, Ukraine, uh, Kazakhstan, South Africa, and we don't have a pipeline system. Uh, for Southeast Asia. So Southeast Asia, um, its, it's uh, long-term plan will basically depend, be dependent, in my opinion, on whether um, China has shale gas resources or not. So China's shale gas resources and Argentina's shale gas resources are the wild cards here. So if China has this large shale gas resource that's affordable, then I think a pipeline system will come down from China uh, through Southeast Asia towards Australia. Uh, but if that uh, shale gas resource doesn't work out, then I think uh, Indonesia's coal will basically be piped or, I mean, uh, shipped as it currently is uh, exported towards uh, China and then India. So, uh, you know, let's take another look at uh, this graph from earlier. And I've inserted basically the resources that I've referred to that we're going to utilize. All right. So. Remember, the purple is what we've already used. Uh, the blue is proved, so we know it's there. We just haven't extracted it yet. And the yellow um, is technically recoverable, but not currently economic. So, um, you know, the plan here is to uh, use these resources and, um, you know, with the oxygen that's provided through electrolysis largely. So, um, you know, we're going to gasify the coal that we know is there and then the CO2 created by that and the other uh, fossil resources that we we'll utilize. So they'll all produce CO2 for enhanced oil recovery. OK, that's how the United States gets 5% of its oil right now. So we can really uh, boost that because, uh, you know, we only get about a third of an oil well and with EOR we can get up to two thirds. So that'll really boost production there. And uh, then, you know, I've already talked about how we can get to this coal. Uh, that's the really deep coal. And uh, we can get to that through underground coal gasification. So everything not only emissions free, but water producing. So, uh, you know, once all of that runs out, well, then, you know, we still got methane hydrates here. OK, so don't forget, you know, we're we're not supply constrained at all. And then once all of that runs out, uh, you know, we're talking, you know, science fiction timelines here. Um, then we can trend go towards algae. So algae is benefited by thermal hydrogen because, um, you know, we can supply it with a cheap source of pure CO2 and then we can use this hydrocarbon emissions free. Uh, so, you know, we've we've solved the uh, CO2 problem for it. Plus, we've increased the value of one of its byproducts because we're we're able to buy the oxygen. So, you know, mid millennia and beyond. Um, you know, we'll we'll go towards algae and that's why um, every continent also goes towards some solar resource. OK. OK, so before I let you go, um, I just want to uh, give you a short term. Uh, let's call it a scenario, not necessarily a forecast, uh, but what I would anticipate happening as a result of thermal hydrogen. So um, we'll talk about electricity on in video seven, but for fossil fuels, I would anticipate petroleum prices going down because we're using fewer uh, internal combustion engines and then we're adding to supply with enhanced oil recovery. And so I would anticipate these uh, suppliers coalescing in price because in thermal hydrogen, you know, they're 
they're not perfect substitutes, but they're pretty near. And, uh, you know, you see over time that people have been fuel switching, uh, you know, between these fuels. So um, I think they'll coalesce over time. And um, I also think that uh, coal will keep them in a pretty tight, you know, band gap here. So uh, this is why I'm so adamant about inclu including coal, you know, not just because, you know, countries will demand that they have, you know, at least access to their own uh, local resource. But from an economic perspective, if these prices get too high, well, then coal gasification uh, will start um, accelerating and then that will bring the price down. Now, why I don't think fossil fuel prices will bottom out is because um, if prices go down further and further, well, then we'll be using less coal because, uh, you know, coal is slightly less efficient and more capital intensive. So, you know, it gets into the mix by being so cheap. So this is why it's it's just good to have better options. And, you know, if, if you want to use fossil fuels emissions free, you know, the key is engineering. Okay, everyone, thank you for uh, giving me the opportunity to share my vision with you. Obviously, it was my pleasure. And so I'd like to end today's video, uh, you know, as always, by thanking someone. So I'd like to take the opportunity to thank um, Janet Jalisi. Uh, she is the um, COO of the National Coal Council. So the National Coal Council has given me the chance to speak at their um, biannual meetings uh, several times now, so including uh, uh, the introduction of thermal hydrogen. And then uh, also Betsy Monsu, she's the CEO of the American Coal Council, and uh, they've given me a chance to speak, and uh, they gave me the opportunity to write in their um, magazine uh, a feature article. Okay, so thank you to Janet and Betsy. Uh, you see everybody, you know, the people in the coal industry, they're not evil. They'll support an emissions-free vision. What you have to do is go down there and talk to them and maybe listen. Okay, so uh, with that, um, I'd just like to thank you for making it through another video. Um, I know this one was quite technical as well, so um, I hope to see you again next time, and uh, I'll be introducing my favorite invention uh, next time, and that's uh, how to um, basically replace the service of aviation. So uh, thank you once again, and I hope to see you again next time. Thank you.